After shooting a few movies in America, producer-director Albert Band moved with his family to Italy to do a string of movies like Massacre at Grand Canyon, which were called Spaghetti Westerns. Spaghetti Westerns were a subgenre of westerns that were shot in Europe and often produced and directed by Italians. The movies were then dubbed into English to sell to the U.S. market. At the time, Rome was called the Hollywood of Italy, and countless films poured out of there during this era. Albert frequently brought his two sons, Charles and Richard, to the sets of his movies. The two became enamored with the process of filmmaking and wanted to get into the industry when they got older. Richard leaned more towards music, so he started composing, while Charles was a combo business and idea man who moved towards producing and directing. Charles became friends with an absolutely brilliant young practical effects artist, Stan Winston. They worked together on Mansion of the Doomed and later Parasite, which was Demi Moore's first movie. During some time off, they came up with an idea. Charles always had an affinity for little monsters, especially puppets. So they designed a creature feature called Beasties. Stan came up with the look for the creatures, and Charles tried to sell the concept for a feature film, but nothing ever came of it. With his years of working in the industry, Albert helped Charles to start his own production company. Band saw the demand for horror and sci-fi films, so he created the independent studio Empire Pictures to compete with Hollywood. The studio became a family affair, with Albert sometimes directing, and Richard doing the music for the various films. Empire made a five-picture distribution deal with Vestron Video. Meanwhile, Luca Bercovici and Jeffrey Levy were a writing team who had just sold their first TV show and were working on a script for a musical about the birth of hip-hop for 20th Century Fox. In 1982, Bercovici starred in Parasite, which band directed. Bercovici was able to bond with the director, since they both grew up in Rome and had plenty of things to talk about. Bercovici spoke to Levy and said, I think I can pitch Charlie an idea, and I think he'll buy it. Bergovici knew Band's affinity for puppets, so he worked with Levy to come up with the concept. It was a spec script that was essentially written to be a one-location shoot about these little demons run amuck over an old mansion. They went scouting in California and found the Waddles Estate in Los Angeles. This was an enormous old building that would be perfect as their haunted house. They pitched the idea to Charles, who loved it, probably because it was so close to his idea for Beasties. They sold it as Fellini Horror on Acid. The duo wrote the script in about 9 or 10 days. As it was originally written, it was very dark, creepy, and filled with disturbing themes. They met with the owners of the Waddles estate to see if they could rent the location. After some talk, they allowed them to film there with very little restrictions. They gave them access to the very large building as well as the surrounding property. They planned to have some scenes that they couldn't film in the house, so they built a basement set at Roger Corman's nearby studio. Berkovici had just worked for Corman as Ace in the movie Space Raiders. The initial budget was somewhere between $200,000 and $400,000. It was now a little further into the 80s, and Stan Winston was busy working on much larger productions like The Hand, The Wiz, and The Thing. Winston was too busy, and not to mention, now too expensive to work on these smaller films. Band asked Winston to recommend someone, and he suggested John Carl Beekler who just recently was working for Corman on the films Android and Forbidden World. Beekler got his start in the industry working with Stan Winston on the island, as well as with Rick Baker on The Incredible Shrinking Woman. To entice him to leave Corman and come over to Empire, Band offered him the job to design the Beasties, as well as the promise of a future directing gig. Beekler loved effects, but he wanted to direct, so he jumped at the chance. Beekler designed 12 different Beasties, and Band chose the five that he liked. He then went to work and sculpted all five monsters in one week. Beekler created the molds and mechanisms to control the monsters over the course of about five weeks. During that time, Charles made good on his promise, so Beekler did the makeup effects and directed a segment in the anthology Rage War, a.k.a. The Dungeon Master. In the original script, the monsters would kill people with an axe. Beekler thought that was boring. How many horror movies are there where the monster kills someone with a weapon? So he suggested the creatures kill people in unique and fun ways, like having two beasties throw another at someone who claws and bites them to death. It was better than just having another person get decapitated. The director started looking into rituals and planned to use excerpts from real rituals to make the ones in the movie feel authentic. It was going to open with a child sacrifice, which would set the tone for this to be a very dark movie. That all changed when the director saw the monsters. Beekler was off designing these little creatures, and when the director saw them, 
he started laughing. It hit him. This movie should be a comedy. Beekler was offended. He said, no, these creatures are scary. The director took one of the beasts and said, John, no, they're not. In fact, they look like you. The director then went back to the script and added in a bunch of little silly moments, which instantly changed the overall tone. This was about two weeks before they started filming. After the modest success of Parasite 3D, Ban thought there might be a new demand for gimmicks, like in the William Castle days. Ban had big plans for the movie. Initially, he wanted to sell it as the film with the most gimmicks in the history of cinema. He was going to have baseball cards, smell vision and the movie was going to be in 3D. With the change in tone, they decided to recast the film. They wanted some unique, offbeat characters for the movie. Johanna Ray, who would later work with David Lynch, brought in a new group of actors more suited for the film. The two biggest were Jack Nance from Eraserhead and Michael DeBarr, the actor who was also a musician. He started working in the industry, mostly doing TV shows like Wacko, and was the lead touring singer for The Power Station. He also wrote the song Obsession, which was a massive hit for the new wave band Animotion. The lead character in the movie was Jonathan Graves, played by Peter Lapis. Originally, Jeffrey Combs auditioned for the role, but lost out. No matter, though, band remembered him, and he was later cast as Dr. West in Reanimator. The two little people in the movie were Peter Risch and Tammy Dutro, who was one of the actors in the E.T. suit. After about five months of pre-production, filming started in January of 1984. They shot for two days with a stereo vision camera when Band looked up how much it would cost to equip 100 theaters in New York with the special projector lenses for the film. He was shocked to find out it was, at a minimum, $3 million. So he said no more 3D. However, there's still traces of 3D in the movie. When the cast puts on the sunglasses, that was going to be the cue for the audience to put on their glasses. With the 3D gone, Band decided to drop all the other gimmicks as well. While they were able to film wherever they wanted within the estate, they weren't allowed to destroy anything, which was a reasonable request. However, having a low-budget company move into your estate for weeks at a time, the potential for disaster was very high. While filming, they were allowed full access to the entire estate, which was enormous. This worked out majorly in their favor. Since the location was so big, they were able to film in many different places, which kept the film from getting stale. For the soundtrack of the film, the director was able to use music from his band, Fila Johnson and the Johnsons. While the band never took off, they did play with some bands who did, like the Red Hot Chili Peppers and the Minutemen. While filming, the associate producer, Deborah Dion, came up with a new title for the film, Ghoulies. While they were working, they got wind of another production being helmed at Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment. This was a film that was being made in secret, Gremlins. So now, both productions were aware of each other. As the filming progressed, there was a problem. With the changes so late in the script, the movie was having major tonal issues. It was at times scary, and at other times funny. That's not an issue if it's balanced out well, but with a bunch of goofy moments added into a serious script, the funny moments feel like they were coming from out of nowhere. It was now a horror film filled with these little non-sequiturs of ghoulies doing silly things. They tried to find the balance and figured they could work all that out in the edit. The green eyes in the movie were special contact lenses. They were thick and filled with a liquid that would glow when you shined a black light on them. Problem was, when an actor was wearing them, they could barely see. This made it difficult for the times when they had to move. Because of this, DeBar refused to wear them for most of his scenes. He only wore them for the times where they were 100% needed. The other problem was the lenses would shift when the actor wearing them would blink, and often gave the wearer derp eyes. They wanted to age the outside of the estate, so they put a wash on it that would make it appear old. They tried to clean this off, but it stained the walls, which greatly upset the owners. Although in the grand scheme, that thankfully was the only damage they did to the location. Filming ran for 25 days. As they were getting closer to finishing, there was a hiccup in the production. That hiccup was that they ran out of money. They then scrambled to try to find additional funds to finish the film. Around that time, another issue popped up. Warner Brothers sued Empire. They claimed the name of Ghoulies was too close to Gremlins, which would cause brand confusion within the audience. It was a short-lived thing, as Warner Brothers dropped the suit not too long after filing. However, because of this and the money issues, 
it allowed Gremlins to come out first. Band was really happy with Ghoulies, and within the film he saw an opportunity. He'd been making movies with his production company, Empire, but they were all being distributed by other companies. This led to many problems, mostly because the distributors either underpaid or didn't pay at all. Band decided that if he was going to have a prolific career in this industry, he needed to self-distribute. He wanted to take this opportunity to make Empire a fully functional production studio and distributor. Only Band was unsure as to what to do. He got in touch with his friend Gary Allen, who put him in contact with an old-school New York show business veteran. He asked him if he'd be willing to mentor him in exchange for a small percentage of the film's profits. Band sent him a copy of Ghoulies, and he got a call back. He told him he liked the film, but it needed a good marketing hook. He told him he'd need a solid ad campaign, which would run about $400,000. Then he'd be able to get the film into about 100 theaters in New York, and the prints would cost around $120,000. You gotta get people's attention. You go big in New York, and that opens all the doors for you to go nationwide. Band was nervous. The distributor told him, You gotta have balls, kid. If the movie works in New York... You'll make millions of dollars. What if it doesn't work? Well, then you're fucked. He emphasized, though, if you lose, at least you gave it a shot. Band decided to go for it. He met with Alan to work on the marketing. Alan was the editor for the Star Wars trailer, so he knew how to sell a movie. Gary Allen was a marketing genius. He saved It's Alive by redoing the ad campaign three years after its initial release. It went from flop for Warner Brothers to a huge box office hit that spawned two sequels. The two talked for hours when Alan came up with an idea. You get a ghoulie coming out of the toilet with a tagline, Ghoulies! They'll eat your ass! Band looked at him and said, That's the worst idea I've ever heard. Alan was like, Sure, but have you ever seen that before? The next day, Band was considering it. He went back to Alan's place and said, You know what? Let's go for it. Alan said, great, but that other line stinks. I've got something much better. Ghoulies, they'll get you in the end. Band went out, bought a toilet, and they did a photo shoot of a ghoulie in the can. They did a test screening, and the audience was angry there was no ghoulie coming out of the toilet. So they went back and shot this little two-second insert and put it into the film. Alan cut a green band trailer, and he made sure to include the toilet bit. The marketing went over better than any of them expected. Ghoulies opened on January 18, 1985. The movie played in 100 theaters in New York, and it went over huge. By Friday, Band knew he had a hit on his hands and spent the weekend thinking about the future. It made over a million dollars, which was huge for a tiny independent film in 100 theaters. Band went to the office on Monday, and his receptionist had a sour look on her face. She told him things were bad and he needed to go to the mailroom. He gets there and the mail lady says, We got a big problem! And dumped out a bag filled with letters. She said, There's more of them and they're all like this. Like what? Band opened a random letter and it read something along the lines of, Dear Hollywood asshole, We've been trying to potty train our kid for a month and your stupid ad campaign scared him so much he refuses to go into the bathroom. Die, 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 die. Initially, Band felt really bad. The ads were playing during Saturday morning cartoons, and he didn't intend on scaring kids. Band called the show business veteran to ask him what to do. He said, You got two choices. Change the campaign or keep it. Keep in mind, a big reason people are going to see the movie is the ghoulie in the toilet. You might kill your golden goose. Band thought about it and said, Fuck it. Let it ride. He chose wisely. Ghoulies went on to make close to $35 million in the box office and even more on home video and cable. Keep in mind, this is back in the day when an average movie ticket would cost you $3.36. It did so well, one weekend it outgrossed Beverly Hills Cop and Rambo. In the domestic box office, it outgrossed Teen Wolf, Fright Night, and Weird Science. Critics hated it, but that didn't matter. 90% of the time, critics trashed anything horror-related. The movie was a major success for Empire, and with the money they made, Empire was able to continue, and Band was in the self-distribution business. With Ghoulies being such a success, Band offered Berkovici and Levy a three-picture deal. There was a dispute over money, and so they turned down the deal and signed a three-picture deal with Canon. 
which led to them doing the comedy Rockula. Unfortunately, Cannon went under shortly afterwards, and they were never able to make their other two films. Beekler continued to work with Band and was able to make his full feature directorial debut with Troll. He eventually was able to go on to direct my personal favorite of the Friday the 13th films with Part 7, The New Blood. Sadly, in March of 2019, John Carl Beekler died of prostate cancer at the age of 66. Band made Ghoulies a franchise and spawned three sequels. However, none of them were able to repeat the success of the original. Although after Part 2, Band sold the franchise to Vestron, but that's a whole other story. The Ghoulies is a highly entertaining film as long as you temper your expectations. Don't go in expecting Gremlins. It's not that. Actually, Ghoulies aren't even in it that much. Kind of like how the puppets aren't in the original Puppet Master very much. Still, it's a weird movie that goes back and forth between dark horror movie and goofy comedy with monsters popping out of the toilet. At the very least, even if you can't appreciate the film, you can appreciate what was made possible because of its success. Movies like Terror Vision, Reanimator, and From Beyond may have never been able to happen if not for the success of Ghoulies. While Empire was only around for a few more years, it gave Band the ability to grow, and after the studio went bankrupt, he was able to start Full Moon, which made some of the best direct-to-video sci-fi and horror films of its time. For most people, The Ghoulies is just a Gremlins knockoff. While I'm sure the success of Gremlins helped the movie, I hope that some people recognize that it indeed was in production long before the Joe Dante classic. Even I once thought that this movie, like Critters, was made to capitalize on Gremlins, when in fact both of those films were in production long before Gremlins was even announced. You can't always believe everything you read online. For example, for some reason, Wikipedia has the budget for this movie set at $5.5 million, even with all the additional charges, like the marketing budget and the film prints, the budget was nowhere near that. If you enjoy movies like the Puppet Master series and have never seen this one, I highly recommend it. Ghoulies! They'll eat your ass! Dick. 